Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 to 15, page 839 uh, in the Bibles here in the church. Uh, if you missed last week's sermon, which was setting up uh, Haggai, uh, when, where, uh, who and what, uh, that's on our website and you can listen to that uh, if you want to know where we are in the Bible. Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 to 15. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. The Lord of hosts says this, These people say, The time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to live in your panelled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now the Lord of hosts says this, Think carefully about your ways. You've planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink but never have enough to become drunk. You put on clothes but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. The Lord of hosts says this, Think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills, bring down lumber and build the house. Then I will be pleased with it and be glorified, glorified, says the Lord. Now you expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. Because my house still lies in ruins, while each of you is busy with his own house. So on your account... The skies have withheld the dew and the land its crops. I've summoned a drought on the fields and the hills, on the grain, new wine, olive oil, and whatever the ground yields, on the people and animals and on all that your hands produce. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of their prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. So the people feared the Lord. Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to the people. I am with you, the Lord's declaration. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, the spirit of the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. They began work on the house of Yahweh of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's an outline there in your service sheets, a uh, bulletin blurb there. Uh, if you want to read that during the week, some uh, household questions up on the top right. Steve's picked up uh, a really important question uh, that most of us have in our lives, but we probably don't often pause to think about it. Uh, what you build shows what is most significant to you. What you build shows what is most significant to you. Uh, now, all of us understand that metaphor of building. We've all got building projects, don't we? Uh, we know that metaphor. But I thought this week that I'd trawl through two online lists just to look at other people's building projects, uh, the world's greatest super yachts and the world's most luxurious houses. Uh, let me tell you that as I went through the top ten, each was more startling than the one that came before. Uh, the opulence was astounding, uh, the detail was mind-boggling, and the dimensions were a little hard for a bloke like me to comprehend. Who needs a home that has 69 acres of floor space? Who needs a house that is 20 storeys high? But let me tell you, I got to the end of those lists and I came to one conclusion. What you build shows what's most significant to you. Haggai asks that same question of God's people today. What does your building project reveal about what is most significant to you? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks that we can read it. Thanks for Haggai. Thanks that he spoke for four months. Thanks that even though he was silent after that, your word isn't. And we have your words in his mouth in your Bible. Thank you that we can read it today. Father, we've all got building projects. Please help us to consider them and ask how they show what is most significant to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Haggai's a prophet. We learned that last week. Uh, He speaks the word of the Lord to God's people. He reminds them that they're God's mob and all that that entails. And Haggai actually speaks in a fairly desolate landscape. Uh, It's a landscape that is very bleak. Uh, He starts speaking on August 29, 520 BC. He speaks for four months. He starts off by speaking to the leaders of God's people, Zerubbabel, the political leader, Joshua, the religious leader, and then he speaks to God's people. Haggai speaks in Jerusalem as God's people struggle to cement, literally, their return to the land. They've been back for 19 years. They've come back with high hopes in all sorts of areas, but life has just worn them down. At the heart of their return, sent back by Cyrus, the emperor of Persia, now living under the rule of Darius, the new emperor of Persia, the heart of their return was one command, rebuild God's house, the temple. Rebuild God's house, the temple. Now, we heard last week what the temple was. Uh, It was a picture in the midst of the capital of God's people. Uh, It was a picture that God wanted to hang out with his mob. It was a picture of how serious sin is because that's what stops them hanging out together. It's a picture of how God will deal with sin at great cost so his mob can live with him. Put simply, smack bang in the middle of Jerusalem is a picture of God's grace. He's committed to a world that hates him through a family descended from Abraham that wanders And through them, God is going to reverse the curse of sin and bring wholeness to the world. Now, God's people have treated that pretty lightly. That's why they were taken away. They'd been negligent. That's why they'd been removed. And that's why they returned with such high hopes. I'm at point two on the outline because Haggai stands up to speak That's the first time a prophet has spoken since God's people have come back. Haggai stands up at a particular festival. It's called the New Moon Festival. Uh, It kicks off the celebration that anticipates a marvellous harvest. Look, God's given us another moon. Harvest is coming in. Maybe this one will be better. So they're all gathered for a big party. And Haggai stands up in the middle of the party and says... Excuse me, but he's had a word to the leaders first. Look at verse 2. The Lord of hosts says this. Notice in verse 1 he's speaking to the leaders. The Lord of hosts says this. These people say, the time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. It's almost like as they're wandering up to the stage for the festivities, Haggai pulls the rubber ball and Joshua into a side room and says, I just want to share with you something before we go out. I want to share with you an insight into the mind of God's people, into the heart of those who are gathered here. They say it's just not the right time to rebuild God's house. It's just a little inconvenient. Now, there are lots of seemingly good reasons for this. There's been a long drought in the land, almost 19 years. Crop after crop has failed. The wages are depreciating. Basic necessities are rising and don't seem to meet basic needs. That's not even considering the local political environment where politicians seem to be ganging up against God's people. Life's tough. Does it sound a little familiar? In such a climate, it's just inconvenient to build God's house. The needed hand is to make a living. It's to put food on the table. It's to make sure the kids have enough. That's the mindset of God's people. And as they walk out onto the stage for the festivities, having just landed that bombshell in the lap of Zerubbabel and Joshua, Haggai then interrupts the proceedings and says, "Uh, I've got a word for you guys. Look at verse 3. The word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet. Uh, Is it a time for you yourselves to live in your panelled houses while this house lies in ruins. He's brave, isn't he? God's people have no time for God's house 
It's inconvenient, but they have plenty of time for their own houses. God's house lies in ruins, and you've got to remember they could see the rubble (laughs) as they gathered for the festival. God's house lies in ruins, but the houses of God's people, they've got very nice interior decorations. They've got the sharpest technology. They've got the best paint. They've got the latest design. God's house lies in ruins. The houses of God's people have the best lawns and the shiniest panels. The people of God are building their own houses, but it's inconvenient to build God's house. And that reveals what is most significant for them, doesn't it? Remember the temple? It was a picture, wasn't it? It's a picture that God wants to hang with his people. It's a picture of how seriously God deals with sin. It's a picture of the grace of God, the undeserved kindness of God who would take rebels and make them whole and welcome them into his house. And it lies in ruins. And so for God's people... God's desire to live with them is not a priority. For God's people, sin is not that serious and God's grace is not enough. But hang on, I've just got to go and talk to the interior decorators about the carpet that I've chosen and the panelling for the hallway. Can you imagine how those words fell in that festival? The word of the Lord through Haggai exposes the heart of God's people and it's not a heart for God. Their life's focused on the horizontal, dictated by the world around them. And as the world dictates their perspective, God's people clearly communicate back to the world what their priority is, what is most significant for them. God's house is in ruins and their panels are shiny. And at this point, God utters an invitation. I'm at point three on the outline in verse five and seven. Think carefully about your ways. Now God's saying, well, why don't you look at things from a different perspective? Now the Lord of hosts says this, think carefully about your ways. You've planted much, harvested little. You eat, never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, never have enough to become drunk. Put on clothes, never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. The Lord of hosts says this, think carefully about your ways. Now, it's a strange logic jump, isn't it? But it seems like that to us. But God's actually inviting his people to view their environment differently. Those words are familiar to them. They're a direct quote from Deuteronomy 28, a series of short, sharp statements that takes them all the way back to the first time they came into the land. They're coming into the land in Deuteronomy and Moses says before they go in, let me share with you what God is on about. Three sermons. This is how you are to view your life as you go into the land. And as you go into the land, let me give you the perspective that matters. It's not the horizontal one, it's the vertical one between you and me. You're my mob. You're my most precious possession. I've given you a job to do. Go out into the world and represent me. And you'll do that by obeying my laws because my laws reveal me. So obey them and you'll show the world what you're like. And when, when you do that, how good is life? And when you don't do that, I will discipline you. The very discipline that Haggai is talking about now. In Deuteronomy 28, 45, all these curses will come, pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed. Since you did not obey the Lord your God and keep the commands and statutes he gave you, these curses will be a sign and a wonder against you and your descendants forever because you didn't serve the Lord your God with joy and a cheerful heart, even though you had an abundance of everything. It's a different perspective on the years of drought, isn't it? A different perspective on the local economy. It's not just a bad season. It's not just political movement. It's just not an economy plummeting. It's the discipline of God. 
It's a different perspective, isn't it? It's a vertical perspective. You're my people. View it from my perspective. And in case they don't get it, and that's the great thing about God, he invites you to think about it, and then, and then he makes it really clear. Uh, I'm at point four on the outline, verse 9. You expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts, because my house still lies in ruins while each of you is busy with his own house. So on your account, the skies have withheld the dew and the land its crops. I've summered a drought on the fields and the hills, on the grain, new wine, olive oil, whatever the ground yields, on the people and animals, on all that your hands produce. Why is life like this? Because God has brought discipline. Why is life like this? Because God has done what he promised. Why is life like this? Because God is bringing his people to their right senses. God's house is in ruins. Their houses have panels. And God has had enough. So what's to be done? Well, look at verse 8. Go up into the hills. Bring down lumber. Build the house. Then I'll be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. Three short, sharp commands. Point five on the outline, go, bring, build. Go, bring, build. Build God's house. I think this is actually the guts of the whole passage because when they devote themselves to the building of God's house, who will be most significant? Did you see it there in verse 8? God will be glorified. When they devote themselves to that building project, they will then show to the world who is most significant in the whole universe. In fact, they'll show that they take sin seriously. They'll show that they understand grace fully. And the key issue is not doing more. The key issue is not bricks and mortar. The key issue is who is most significant. The key issue is the glory of God, the statement to the universe that God is most significant, that God is the priority, not only for the world but for his people. It's a statement to the world that dwelling with God is the most wonderful, all-encompassing thing that matters, that sin itself is desperately serious. That the forgiveness of sins by God's grace alone dwarfs everything that we might seek and search for. And at that moment, when their houses are flash and his house is in ruins, God's people don't hold God in high regard. Remember the circumstances? I'm at point six. It's a massive festival to celebrate the new moon and the coming harvest. You've now got a new perspective on that, don't you? And Haggai has stood up and he's drawn back the curtains on their houses so we can look into their hearts. How do they respond? Look at verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him. So the people feared the Lord. A, a, an immediate response. No, we thought, come on, let's be a little reasonable here. <laughs> come on, let's have a little bit of common sense. Do you see what they did? They hear and they fear. They hear and they fear. God's words are very clear, aren't they? And in case you missed it, you can see the picture language of the rubble and the panels. And because they hear, they fear God. Uh, It's a special word here. It's not that quiet reverence that we like, but it's a hand that has reached in and grabbed your guts so that you sweat with fear because you realise you haven't taken God seriously you realise that you have treated God with disdain. You realise you've minimised sin and taken advantage of grace. And so they fear him when they're confronted by their lukewarmness. Look at verse 13. 
Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to the people. I'm with you, the Lord's declaration. How good is God? They've left his house in ruins. They've spent 19 years on their own houses. They hear and fear. And what does God say? I'm with you. How good is God? Immediately. Notice there's no pause. Notice there's no three-month probation to make sure you're on track. Notice there's no key performance indicators. They go, we hear and we fear you, God. And God says, I'm with you. In fact, I've always been with you. (laughs) That's why I sent Haggai. And the response of God doesn't stop there because in verses 14 through to 15, did you notice what he did? He reinvigorated them. He restored their energy. He took their redirected focus on him and took it to rebuilding his house so that the world would see how glorious he is. What you build shows what is most significant to you. What you build reveals the glory that concerns you. What you build is what you love. In a desolate landscape, Haggai brings God's word to God's people. As Steve's pointed out, we don't have a temple, do we? (laughs) We're not returning from exile, and we certainly don't live in a landscape where we're under physical attack. So how does Haggai speak to us? I'm at point seven on the outline. The heart of applying a prophet like Haggai is understanding the temple and glory, the key issue. Remember what the temple was a picture of? God's desire to live with his mob and the serious nature of sin and how it is dealt with. So let me ask you a question. Where do we go to meet God? And where do we go to have our sin dealt with? Perhaps I should phrase it a little differently. Who do we go to to meet God? Who do we go to to have our sin dealt with? Well, Jesus is where we meet God. John chapter 1, verse 18, he is the exact image of God. Jesus is where we go to have our sin dealt with. His life, death, and resurrection is a statement that the sacrifice has been paid. You don't have to come and sacrifice your breeding stock every year because God sacrificed his one son. Jesus is who the temple was a picture of. And so if you listen to that second reading that Seamus brought from Ephesians, when you're connected to Jesus, you're being built into a what? Into a temple, aren't you? A building. Something whacked down here in the middle of Narrabri to show God's desire and to show how seriously God takes sin. You're being built into a living picture in the world today of who God is and what he's done for us. God's people today, like God's people right throughout the ages, like God's people in Haggai, are to be a living picture of God. His desire to live with people and his grace in dealing with sin. To live with this as their priority, that's how God's people show how significant he is. To live with that building project, That's to show the world what God is on about. And Jesus describes it, doesn't he? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. What you build shows what is most significant to you. What you build shows the glory that concerns you. What you build is what you love. I'm happy to say that when it comes to the worlds of super yachts and trophy homes. (laughs) But are our homes any different? Whose house are you building? I'm at the last point on the outline. Whose house are you building? What does your building work show about what is most significant to you? The building work for God's people today remains the same. It's the building work that says to the world, God is most significant. God wants to live with you. And God, in all of his grace, 
has dealt with the seriousness of sin. Such building work is to speak of Jesus. It's to gather as God's mob in community. It's to grow individually as God's people in the image of God. It's to take sin seriously and a revel in grace. It's at least gathering in church, at least gathering for encouragement, at least growing in godliness through daily reading of God's word, at least speaking in our town that Jesus matters, at least living in a landscape that says, here's Jesus and there is no one so significant. Is that the house you're building? Or is there another house we are building as God's house lies neglected? Such a building decision is a daily decision, isn't it? It's a daily statement of who is most significant. It encompasses the sport choices for our children and the education in our families. It will will cover employment decisions and property purchases that necessitate certain incomes. It will cover your streaming services, your holiday decisions, even how you decide your family time. How do all of those show what is most significant? How do all of those show the desire of God to live with his people and the seriousness of sin? Are you thinking carefully? Haggai asks God's people to do that, and it brings another perspective on the landscape, doesn't it? Well, the same invitation is made today. Could the distance we feel towards God be the result of us choosing not to hang out with God and his people? Could the coldness of our family towards Jesus be because we have actually shown that he's really not that important in our lives? Could our lack of contentment with Jesus and his people be because we don't actually think he's enough to deal with our brokenness? Could the disinterest of our family and friends when we want to talk to them about Jesus be because our lives don't take him seriously enough? Do we think carefully about our ways? And are we listening? That was Haggai's invitation in that desolate landscape. And they heard and they feared. Will we do the same today? Will we hear and will we fear? The key is not building more. It's building rightly. Building in a way that says God is significant. Jesus is enough. Look at the wonder of his grace. Are we actually listening? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It's blunt. It's incisive. It's described in Hebrews as a sword. Sometimes it's a club. Sometimes it's a scalpel. Father, whatever it is, it exposes our building projects, your desire, and our response. Father, help us to hear and fear and to devote ourselves to the building project that says God is most significant. In Jesus' name, amen.